board. So, Chair will ask our clerk to take a please record that note in the presence of the members in the absence. Those who are not yet here, let's let's first let's first take up the matter of the organizational motions for this meeting. Chair sure recognize the president. Okay, okay then we'll defer that. Let's go ahead and take up in the minutes of our last meeting for approval. Those are in your packets available. Please take a moment and consider the draft that you have available. Ready? Okay. Sure. Recognize President Blair. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, I move amendment from January 8th, 2023, meeting be approved as approved. Question to the President's motion that the draft minutes of the last meeting of the committee of January 8th, 2023, be approved as distributed. Is there discussion on that motion? If not, those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. If not, or those opposed to the motion, please say no. The ayes have it. Chair declares that motion adopted. All right, let's take up our first post audit report for today. We have a presentation on ABCA enforcement. Good afternoon, members of the subcommittee. I'm Max Cole, senior auditor for the Legislative Post Audit Committee. Today I'm presenting a report on the Alcohol Beverage Control Administration, or ABCA, which is in the green folder in your packet. A prior report was issued on the ABCA at the June 2022 interim meeting. And this report covers the final outstanding objectives on the audit of the ABCA concerning the enforcement division. The ABCA monitors compliance with applicable laws pertaining to alcoholic beverages through its enforcement division. The ABCA has divided the state into three enforcement regions. The eastern region, the western region, and the northern region is depicted on the PowerPoint slide. The division is typically comprised of one enforcement director, three enforcement supervisors, and approximately 18 enforcement agents. The ABCA is responsible for the enforcement of approximately 7,000 licensees, including retail liquor outlets, restaurants, bars, clubs, golf courses, and breweries. The audit of the enforcement divisions involve following up on issues identified in previous legislative audit reports. One of the previous findings selected in the follow-up concerned the ABCA's compliance with internal controls regarding the impress funds, which may be used for ID compliance, underage stains, and other enforcement duties. Another finding selected for review related to overtime payments made to overtime exempt employees. The legislative auditor found no instances of internal control deficiencies or of non-compliance regarding the impress fund or overtime payments. The legislative auditor commends the ABCA on the actions taken to address these previous recommendations. We also followed up on an issue concerning the assessment of fines and penalties for licensee violations through the enforcement division, which was an issue identified in five prior legislative audit reports of the ABCA. Past audit reports noted several substantial differences between fine amounts levied by the ABCA against various licensees for similar violations and difficulty determining <coughs> fines were assessed at the year. This is shown in the table on page three of the report. In that table from the 2009 report, you will note that for the same first offense violation, the same violation of code, one fine was issued for $100, 18 for $150, and 10 for $500. The auditors could not obtain evidence to support the difference in fine amount, citing the lack of a fee schedule as a contributing factor. During our audit, we also received several complaints from licensees alleging inequitable treatment of fine amounts issued through the enforcement division. Complaints ranged from vague rules, inconsistent application, inequitable treatment, and the potential for retaliation. While our audit did not attempt to directly investigate or validate these claims, they were taken into consideration in our audit procedures. Auditors attempted to verify specific fine amounts for specific violations in the ABCA's current violation reports similar to the audit procedures in 2009. However, we were unable to do so due to how fines are assessed as a whole amount for multiple violations and a lack of additional information in the violation reports to make any further determination. Essentially, for many violations, a single fine amount is issued for a combination of violations, with no indication as to what specific amount was assessed for each violation. Therefore, we were unable to perform the same analysis for comparison to the 2009 report data to determine how fines for violation are currently assessed to identify any variances in fine amounts. When attempting to determine individual fine amounts and the reasoning for the amount, 
The auditors encountered the following issues. One, the ABCA has no procedures in or schedule establishing a range for fine amounts for each type of violation. Two, there are no established parameters for assessing fines at higher amounts. For example, what circumstances might justify assessing a higher fine or more severe penalty? Three, there were numerous instances where the ABCA assessed individual licensees one all-encompassing fine for multiple violations. Therefore, any one-to-one -one comparisons of fines for like violations cannot be made. And lastly, there's no process in place documenting the commissioner's use of discretion in assessing fines, such as a memorandum placed in the licensee's file, even those in excess of the norm. <clears throat> Our review noted some potential disparities in fine amounts assessed for similar violations. In addition, previous audit reports in relation to current violation records indicated some potential disparities between fines and penalties levied for similar violations between differing ABCA commissioners. However, as stated before, auditors were unable to determine the extent of these potential disparities due to a lack of information for all assessed funds. Although maximum penalties are set out in statute, commissioners are in a discretion when deciding on the severity of penalties and fine amounts for violations. It is our understanding that the commissioner, through his discretion, may assess these fine amounts as a whole based on the evidence provided through the violation report and when necessary through consultation with the enforcement agent or enforcement director. The ABCA commissioner stated he is personally and solely responsible for the determination of fines and penalties issued against licensees and this discretion is not delegated. While the violation reports contain evidence and circumstances documented by the enforcement agent to support cause for violation, the commissioner indicated there are times when, based on his review of the evidence in the reports, the evidence does not support the violation. In these cases, the ABCA may drop a violation from the report. Additionally, some violation reports may be detailed in documenting these circumstances and evidence, while others may not, and provide minimal information concerning the violation adding to the difficulty in determining if fine amounts were reasonable or how they were determined. Our audit does not find any issues with how this discretion is currently being applied or the judgments made in arriving at these fine amounts. Rather, our issue is with the lack of this specific documented information that delineates each fine amount or each violation to arrive at the total assessed fine and additional information that may explain the reasoning for higher fine amounts. The lack of this information precludes auditors from making any further determination on the reasonableness or equitability of how these fines and penalties are assessed. This may also cause confusion to a licensee who, absent a fee schedule for how fines by the ABCA are assessed, may not understand the amount of the fine or the justification. If a licensee was potentially treated with bias or favoritism in how a fine was assessed, it is impossible for auditors to make this determination based on the documentation maintained by the ABA, ABCA, it does not provide detail on the individual fine amounts, how they were determined, or the justification or evidence relied upon to assess the amount. While this is less concerning for fine amounts that fall within the norm, those fine amounts that may be outside of the norm due to extenuating circumstances or the egregious nature of the violation could benefit from the additional documented information by clearly indicating the factors and judgments that led to a fine that was in excess of the normally assessed fine amount. In our review of other states' alcohol beverage control organizations, we found 30 states where 60% have a posted fee schedule for how they assess fines. In addition, as detailed further in the report, Legislative Services is of the opinion that the current appeals process, coupled with the lack of clear information on cause and specific fine amounts provided to licensees, may present a 14th Amendment due process issue. When a fine and penalty is issued, the licensee receives an option letter where they can choose one of two options, to accept the assessed fines or penalties, or they can choose to request an administrative hearing. Currently, if the licensee wishes to appeal a decision by the ABCA commissioner, they may appeal through the administrative hearing process by indicating each error that the petitioner alleges to have been committed by the commissioner. <coughs> However, it is not clear how a licensee can indicate each error concerning a fine, absent knowledge of the fine amounts for each violation, or the reasoning or justification the fine amounts were assessed. This appeals hearing is also conducted by the ABCA commissioner or his designated hearing examiner. There is an additional optional appeal to the Circuit Court of Carroll County, but based on statute, it appears to limit that to an appeal of the legality of the commissioner's orders rather than appeal to disagree with the amounts fined or the violations issued. 
situation of appealing through the same entity that issued the fine against the licensee and the costs associated with doing so may cause a chilling effect on licensees who may desire to appeal. It is the opinion of legislative services that these circumstances do not represent a true appeals process and may not provide the petitioner a full due process, presenting a potential conflict with the 14th Amendment. Again, our current audit does not find any issues in the judgment or discretion that is being applied by the current ABCA commission. The issue is merely a matter of insufficient documentation that prevents the auditors from determining how some fine amounts are determined or the justification for doing so based on the documentation maintained by the ABCA. The lack of specific information for individual fine amounts and the judgments or conditions that led to that determination precludes any further conclusions as to the reasonableness of fines assessed or the funds were assessed equitably. It is our opinion that transparency and the assurance of equitability in the treatment of licensees would be better achieved through enhanced documentation of the specific fine amounts associated with each violation. The use of a fee schedule similar to what 30 other states utilize may also reduce confusion among licensees as to the equitability of their treatment. Further, when a fine is assessed significantly higher than what is typically assessed due to additional circumstances, we recommend the ABCA document those circumstances or reference those already documented in the violation report that are used as justification for the increased fine amount. These processes can help ensure consistency in the actions of the ABCA and may also promote consistency across administrations who can better rely on the documented justifications of the prior administration. Finally, as these assessed fines are subject to appeal, it provides transparency to the licensee as to why the actions against them were taken and why fines were assessed to better inform them prior to initiating an appeal. To correct these noted issues, the legislative audit makes the following recommendations. One, the ABCA established a fee schedule that would create minimum and maximum fine amounts for each type of violation, along with parameters for how fines may be assessed beyond the minimum and what specific factors should cause a higher assessed fine. Two, when the commissioner exercised discretion to deviate from the baseline limit of fines and other sanctions, the commissioner should provide detailed documentation supporting the basis for such deviations in a readily accessible format. Three, the ABCA developed policies and procedures specific that include a copy of the fee schedule and parameters for how fines may be assessed beyond the minimum and what specific factors should cause a higher assessed fine. And lastly, if any due process issues that remain unaddressed, we recommend the legislature and ABCA consider modifying statutes and rules pertaining to the appeals process that ensures conformity to due process standards. This concludes my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Okay, thank you very much. That's that's a very comprehensive report. I appreciate it. I, I have many questions, but before we before we do, there's no objection. We'll, we'll invite the agency to offer any, any comments the agency may want to offer at this time. Mr. Speaker. Yes, sir, please. Mr. Hickman. You don't have to proceed. Yes, sir. Help yourself, sir. <clears throat> We do have folks perhaps watching on our live stream, so if, if you don't mind, please identify yourself so that they, they can hear who's who's there. Perfect. Thanks, sir. I, I didn't prepare a whole presentation like Mr. Cole here, but what I'd like to do is basically do a brief introduction. Uh, my name is Fred Wooten, and I'm the Commissioner of the Western Alcohol Beverage Control Administration. This gentleman here is Benny Eppling. Mr. Eppling is my enforcement director of Western ABCA. I started in the, in the spirits beverage industry in West Virginia in 1978, basically bartending at the local disco hotspots in my hometown. I worked as a bartender, as a bar manager, lounge coordinator, food and beverage director, and assistant manager of a hotel where I ran the bars, restaurants, and hotel operations in my hometown. I did that for about 12 years. On October 16th of 1991, I was hired by Western Alcohol Beverage Control as an, enforce, as an inspector in 1991, I moved up through the ranks as an inspector, enforcement agent, enforcement supervisor, and ultimately in 2017 as the ABCA commissioner. So between my time on this side of the bar and my time on this side of the bar, I have 44 years of experience in the beverage alcohol industry in the state of West Virginia. In my first 25 years, I worked in the Enforcement Division of West Virginia Alcohol Beverage, serving under six different ABCA commissioners in my first 25 years. 
I like to think that I've picked up tasks, picked up tidbits from each of the six commissioners that I worked for prior to being appointed as the ABCA commissioner. Western ABCA holds a seat on the National Alcohol Beverage Control Association, made up of my peers in 17 surrounding states. There. I currently hold a position of chair elect of that of the National Association there. And in the end of this month, there, I'll be become the first chairman of the board of directors of the National Alcohol Beverage Control Association, voted on by my peers. I'll serve from the end of May of 23 to May of 2024. One of my priorities and my core values at ABCA is I'm here to put people in business. One of my slogans that I talk about when I meet with Mr. Epping and his enforcement staff is I preach the code value, the core value of enforcement, excuse me, of education over enforcement. I want our enforcement agents to educate our licensees on what the law says they're allowed to do, any changes in the law. I want my enforcement agent, Mr. Epping's agents, to conduct ID trainings for our agents, so if our licensees so they don't have violations and any new changes that the legislature would act. Mr. Eckling has had multiple roles at Western Alcohol Beverage Control. He's also been in the bar business as well. So with Mr. Eckling's time there, he has approximately 40 years in the beverage alcohol industry in the state of West Virginia. But I receive a vial, so this is the way it works here. So our enforcement agents are together, they're the finders of fact. They, they do, they respond to complaints, they conduct investigations, benefits and reports charging specific sections of the code of violations there. Workflow allows those violations to be sent up to the enforcement supervisor who can send it back for a further investigation. We'll move the work process on to Mr. Eckling, the enforcement director. Mr. Eckling can do that same thing. He can gather additional facts, forward the violation back for further investigation. He can forward it on to me for my review. I review every violation that comes across my desk at this agency next. What I look for is I look for how long has the business been in business, the violation history, the duration since their last violation, the seriousness of the violation, did we catch one kid or did we catch 20 kids in there? The number of charges cited in the administrative citation violation there and whether there was any supporting documentation from law enforcement that would corroborate that violation for Using, using that, that information, my 44 years of experience in the beverage alcohol industry, I think the code gives me discretion to apply my knowledge and experience <coughs> to applying sanctions to our licenses. One thing that I heard Mr. Culp say, which I, I disagree with what he's saying there, was that the ABCA commissioner conducts administrative hearings. That is absolutely not correct. I have seen it done one time in 1991. The commissioner was Harry Camper, who was a former U.S. attorney there. Mr. Camper at times did serve as his own administrative law judge. Five commissioners have, after Mr. Camper have never done it. And so the ABCA does not, I do not hold administrative hearings. We have a very competent Charleston attorney who is very knowledgeable in the laws, rules, and regulations of our code there. He conducts our ABC administrative hearings. If the licensee requests a hearing and comes and shows to the hearing with no counsel there, our administrative law judge bends over backwards to ensure the fairness of the process there and to make sure that our licensee who is challenging the violation is all of his rights are protected there. <coughs> our, our, our administrative law judge bends over backwards to make sure that our licensee is fair and equitable treatment there. So after Mr. Epling reviews the violations, he can make a recommendation to me. I will look at the violations and we send out two letters. First letter basically details the date of the infraction and, and the sections of the code that we are charging there. The second page of that letter basically gives the, gives the licensee the option to settle the violation or they can request an administrative hearing. If they request an administrative hearing, they have full due process to their day in court to, to explain their side of the situation. So in, in, in Mr. Cole's response there, there are two charts there dated back from 2009. It's hard for me to respond to those violations that were 2009 because perhaps I may have written some of those violations in my previous role with the ABC agency. But I can assure you that I, I use good judgment and common sense, my knowledge, for I apply sanctions to our licensees. I'm in the business to safely and responsibly sell alcohol beverages in the state of business. I need our licensees in business so I can sell, so I can safely sell alcohol to those folks. 
I, I know the economic hardships in the state about how it is and how tough it is to make a profit in the food and beverage industry there. Last thing I want to do is treat someone unfairly there and to sanction them out of the business. Mr. Cole brings up the fact there that um, that I don't specifically say this violation is violation. If, if we have a bar that's operating at 4.30 in the morning on a Sunday morning in violation of the law, our agents usually respond to a complaint. They'll go in there. The first violation is probably cessation of entertainment since the music has to show up at 2.30. Second is the hours for sale of operation. The bar is rolling, the drinks are flowing there. The premises are still occupied. So rather than looking at it as three, so it's three separate violations, I look at it as one after hours incident there. I, I don't impose a fine for the cessation of entertainment, selling alcohol after the hours, or being on the premises here. I look at that violation in its entirety before I assess the fine. We strive to make sure that we treat all of our licensees fairly there. If someone is not being treated fairly there, they certainly have the right to, to the, to the uh, full to the uh, appeals process. They can request an administrative hearing. And that, that, that process is able to be appealed up to the, I believe it's the Intermediate Court. I believe there's a change used to go to circuit court. I believe it goes to the Intermediate Business Court. And ultimately, if you go to the State Supreme Court of Appeals. That kind of concludes my opening statement, and I apologize if I was rambling. Oh, it, it, it's, it's fine. I, uh, let, let me just, before we begin with questions, let me hopefully perhaps set the stage for our discussion here. Uh, I sense a little tension in the response. Mr. Mr. Allred and his team are very thorough and do a very good job. They have issued many reports very critical of agencies before. This is not one of them. <laughs> this, not this, is, this is not one of them. So I, this is actually a complimentary report. I commend the student for the work they do and the acknowledgement that we are doing some things right at ABC. In his report there, they mentioned about that five different times that the auditor's office has, has come up with this recommendation there and beginning in 99, 03, 04, 06, 09 there. So this is the sixth time that we've put this together there. I think what the auditor's office is doing is you're trying to create a solution for a problem, in my eyes, that does not exist. Great questions from the members. President Blair. Oh, well, I will. I've got a couple for you. Yes, sir. I might go outside the scope. I don't know. Um, how often do you personally overrule the agent's decisions, violations? How, do you, how frequently do you run across that? Most of the time, I will send violations back for further investigation. I review the narrative of the violation to see if, if the narrative will support the charges that we that the agent has listened to. If I don't think that the agent if the agent has met has not met the burden of proof that the narrative supports violations there, I'll have Director Eppling send it back, refer it back to the agent there for additional investigation. If I still don't feel it meets needs, I will dismiss the violation. I take underage consumption of alcohol in this state very seriously. I think that Mr. Eppling and I and our enforcement staff. We are saving lives of young West Virginians trying to keep alcohol out of the hands of underage buyers in this state. Just led into my next question. Thank you. Um, and uh, you, you were talking about violations of the establishment. What about violations of the individual? And what I'm specifically getting at is, is bartenders at one o'clock in the morning slinging drinks for tips and that, that happens. I've seen it happen. And so is there anything that goes after that individual that is pouring those drinks when they know they don't need to, or is that directly going to the establishment? Great question. Thank you, sir. Um, our authority is an ABCA. We're an administrative agency there. We work closely with city officers, with county officers, and with state police officers in our investigations there. So what, what our agent, Mr. Epping's agent, would do, we would cite the licensee, the license holder of the business there for the infraction there. We would educate the seller that. And in cases for underage sale there, our agents do not have the authority to write criminal citations there. So that's where we would rely on our law enforcement partners to cite the store clerk or the bartender. We would cite the licensee. The law enforcement would cite the individual bartender. Therein lies the rub. So that establishment, that licensee, fires that individual, and they just go down to the street, and they're picked up at the next place. And there's no tracking mechanism for that individual. 
to, to, to be able to track that. Am I wrong or am I right on that? You're spot on. So let me ask another question. And I'm not a big fan of licenses and regulations and all that. But in fact, I'm trying to take some of this stuff off the books. You, know, you shouldn't have to uh, get a license to be able to braid hair, for instance. But would that be a tool that could actually help these establishments by licensing the bartenders and the servers? Maybe a better way for me to put it. Uh, so that they don't end up the next establishment, the next establishment, the next establishment. Well, server licensing is a pretty common practice, although it is not required in West Virginia there. We, we would certainly welcome having servers issue licenses so we could track to find out who the continual offenders of this. So there's no white, that, so that's what I'm getting at. There's, unless the establishments talk to themselves, to each other, you don't know that somebody got fired. The specific bartender, no, sir, I did not. But I think in, in most areas there, those bar owners, they communicate back and forth pretty frequently, I think. As a matter of fact, most of the complaints we get are from the neighboring bar down the street. So then, what I just, the question I just asked, it's unnecessary to license them because they've got a communication network in place already. That would be a fair statement, yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Great questions from others. Go to Young. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for being here, Commissioner. You have a ton of experience in this. Um, I have a lot of questions. How many fines were there last year? Or like, what's an average? It, the ballpark is fine. It's tough to say. I, I would say the ballpark of our fines there. It, it's not my. It's not my goal to find people out of, of business. Course. We're basically a, probably a first offense in underage alcohol sale. We're looking back to basically a monetary sanction of one hundred and fifty dollars. But I mean, how, what's the number? How many of those do you, do you guys give out every year? We, we probably we probably review probably three to four hundred violations a year. Okay. Okay. So do you spend a lot of your time personally? Is this a large part of your job? It's it's a. It is such an important function of my job. I would never delegate that to anyone there. Like I said, I, I review about six different things on determining the sanctions there. I'll go back and look at past history and read past violations before I use my judgment and experience to impose a final license. Okay. Can you kind of walk me through what what happens when somebody makes a call, there's an underage drinker, one of um, one of Mr. Epling's agents goes out. What can you just walk me through what happens? Exactly. Um, we receive complaints here, and our agency does what we call underage compliance checks, commonly known as beer things. We call them a compliance check. We want everyone in the state to, to, to make sure that they check the ID, make sure that we're not trying to set anyone up to entrap anyone. We just want them to be in compliance with the law. The law says you've got to be 21 years of age to be able to out purchase or consume alcohol. So we would get a complaint on Fred's bar and grill. Mm -hmm. now, Mr. Eppley would arrange a compliance check in the in the area where that's at there. We would go out and we would visit 10 to 20 different locations just so that we're being fair and consistent with everyone there. We we hire only really good quality underage kids there. We're not flipping kids that are trying to work off a DUI or something like that. Most of the time we hire children that are sons of police officers or firefighters there that volunteer to come to do work for us there. So we check the ID before the, the detail starts. We photograph the, the underage alcohol buyer. We photograph their ID. And the, the safety of the underage alcohol buyer is paramount to our operations here. If there's any chance that something may go south, we're pulling out of that. So the underage alcohol buyer would go into the convenience store with the license established there, always accompanied by an undercover ABCA enforcement agent there. Uh, the underage buyer goes to the out to the beer cooler, out to the counter, puts the product on there. At that point, we're hoping that they check the ID, tell them no, you're under 21 years of age, we can't sell to you, we ask the store. Quite often, they, they, the clerk or the bartender will check the ID, fail in their task, make the sale to the underage kid. At that point, the underage kid brings the alcohol out to us, the enforcement comes out there, we document the occurrence right at the time of spot there, at the time of the violation there, then we'll probably drive the underage kid off there. The law enforcement and another enforcement agent, ABCA, goes in, speaks to the licensee, and speaks to the seller of the alcohol. We do that in a, in a private manner. We're not trying to embarrass anyone. And we issue a citation 
for, the, for the, a criminal citation for the sale of alcohol. Mr. Epping and his agents would issue an administrative violation to the license holder. So, Go ahead. Uh, so at that point, that's when we start the workflow sends it to the enforcement supervisor, the director Epling, and all the way to myself. Okay. And when I say that there, we do alcohol buys all, all the time in the state, and, and we probably look at three or four violations. There are no two violations that are exactly the same. Okay. Um, the instance that you said, the bar that's open late, and you've got three different things going on, clearly a very different type of situation. So let's walk through that situation. Somebody calls, bar's open late, they've, they've hit three different things that are wrong. If I'm that bar owner, then what happens to me? Do I get a letter that says, here's the three things I did wrong? Because it seems like that's part of, part of this report as to people not fully understanding what all they did. So what's our documentation you guys do and me, the bar owner that did the three things? What kind of documentation do I receive? So actually, the, the night of the incident at 4.30 in the morning, my enforcement agents are in there. And they're, they're telling the bar owner, they're getting the bar aside there and saying, hey, look, you're in violation of cessation of entertainment. All music shuts off at 2.30. You're in violations of sale of alcohol after 3 a.m. in the morning. You're also in violation of the premises occupied after 3.30 in the morning. So the bartender, the licensee, the manager of the bar, they know the night, the night of the infraction there. What, what the situation is okay. and at that point that's when we follow up with the two letters so it, then i get a thing in writing that also lists all three of those absolutely yes. but then it, i would get a fee that would just be all of of just one fee so yes. there's no breakdown that's correct okay. I, I look at it as one violation there are three different sections of the code that we're citing there but i look at it as one under one after hours infraction there and i would impose a penalty encompassing cessation of entertainment hours for sale hours of operation okay. Oh, thank you. That's all I've got for now. And, and as Mr. Eppin points out, in the letter that we sent out to the licensee, all three of those site, those code sites are clearly listed. The section of the code and the code description are all listed in that letter. And what portion of people, if there's two options, they can just pay it or they can appeal? About how many appeal? They can request an administrative hearing is, is the second option. Okay. And to be honest with you, most of the time, there, the people that check that, that box that they request an administrative hearing, basically they just want their side of the story presented there. So Mr. Eppling gets frequent phone calls from folks that check that they want to request an administrative hearing there. They basically want to sound off and give their side of the story. Of course, there's that we know there's always two sides of the story there. And so most of the time, Mr. Eppling, I don't want to speak to you, but I believe Mr. Eppling says, we, we understand your concerns about the violation here. We understand that you've got this information for your employees and the bartender. This is what this is what we're we're ready to present in an administrative hearing. We check the kids' ID. We photographed them. We photographed their ID. We sent them in there, accompanied by an undercover enforcement agent. There, they made a purchase. They bought a Bud Light. They paid two seventy five for the Bud Light. They walked out. So, and how many of of these three to four hundred? About how many people choose that second option? To, to actually go through for, for a hearing there, a very, very small percentage. Okay. Thank you. Other questions from members? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You have a licensee that has a long history of repeated violations. Is there some point that you pull their license? Well, not that I pull their license. The way it goes through the administrative process here, they have the opportunity to present their case in an administrative hearing. We have a very competent administrative law judge makes a recommendation to myself and I can accept his recommendation, I can reject his recommendation, or I can use parts of his recommendation. So it, they have legal process there. So there are times we have some bad actors there. We have a revocation pending right now that we're waiting for findings of facts and conclusions as law well that will be presented. To this. So the administrative law judge will get all that information to the attorneys on both sides there. He'll make his recommendation to me. And like I said earlier, I'm not into business to put people out of business. If we have really, really bad actors, we need to bring those folks in to protect your families and my families. Is there anything in place that would keep that individual, if he's no longer qualified to have a license in the state of West Virginia, to keep, to keep his wife, for him to come back in, use his wife to open up, she's now the licensee, and he's back in business? And the, and the plain answer to your question, sir, is not really. You know, although we, if we suspect that, we suspect a hidden ownership, you know, violation like that, we would require the wife to basically sign an affidavit that says, 
I, I'm not fronting this license for anyone. My husband has no affiliation with this bar, this licensee. We have so we we have her to sign a completed affidavit prior to that, but that's a really tough thing to handle for us, and it, it's a problem. And I'm I'm confident at times it goes all over, but we do our darnest to ferret out situations like that. Thank you, I'm going outside the scope now. Well, let me stay on scope. <laughs> uh, I, I want to get the law clear. So, Mr. Cole, why don't we turn back to you? So, the sorry, we have legislative services yeah. attorney here that can speak. I want to I want to get the appeal process right. So, we heard a couple different versions of that. So, who who'd like to who'd like who'd like to lay out for me the appeal process? Um, so, the appeal process is outlined is currently in what. Uh, Legislative Rule 17502, Section 6, and that's where we delineate all of our information that you heard in the presentation outlined that. Um, basically, if you have any questions specific to that in the process, I know the commissioner said that there is a lawyer that they use. Basically, it's himself or anyone that he appoints can hold that seat. So that's that your ALJ, right? Yes, I would never be here. I'm not an attorney. Okay. And the ALJ is making recommendations to you. That's correct. Yes. And whose who's, who's, who's decision is appealable? The commissioner's or the ALJ's? Um, the commissioner's. Okay. And to whom is it appealable? It's appealable to the commissioner um, and then you can also go to court and file in circuit court. So you make the first appeal back to the commissioner? So that'd be the that'd be the civil procedure equivalent of a motion for rehearing. Yes. Okay. Mr. Speaker, that's not my understanding. I think when I make my rec when I receive the recommendation from the administrative law judge, we issue our final order there. At that point, it's my understanding that the licensee it used to be the licensee would appeal to the Circuit Court of Canola County. I believe there's a change in the statute now. I believe that now appeal goes to the intermediate court. Well, that's that would be after the administrative. Hearing. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so the administrative hearing, if, if the licensee is still aggrieved, can go on to the ICA. Uh, uh, the, code, the code allows them to appeal to the commissioner, uh, allows um, a, an appeal after mm -hmm. that to circuit court. To circuit court. After the first. Now it's the intermediate court yeah. appeals. Oh, right. Do we need to clear that up? Uh, I'm not sure if that's being modified. Well, I mean, I've, I've, I've now heard three versions of this. Current, so. current legislative rule, I believe, currently lists Kanawha County Circuit Court okay. as the Court of Appeal, but I believe, given the recent change in the Intermediate Court of Appeals, that should be replaced. I'm not sure, and I can't speak to ABCA's rule change and whether or not they're seeking to modify that, but possibly so that is something that needs to be rectified. So, where's the record made? The original record. In the administrative hearing. In our administrative hearing, there. The attorneys for the bar, the licensee there, uh, they do their findings, fact, conclusions of law. Our, our representation out of the AG's office submits their findings, and facts, conclusions of law. So the administrative law judge reviews the briefs filed by our attorney who's representing out of the AG's office there and the licensee's attorney. It's my understanding that the administrative law judge reviews both of those sets of documents, their briefs there, to, prior to making his recommendations to myself. And it's that record that's appealable. That is all that is appealable, I believe. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. Well, that was my understanding, but we, we heard a different presentation, so I wanted to say if, that, if that's unclear somewhere in our legislative rules or what have you. in statutes regarding these appeals. I think that this will be the appropriate time during this legislative rulemaking process to someone to clean that up in the subsequent. Okay, that's good. So we've got we've got that. So I want to talk about the this, this difference of opinion on the applicability or appropriateness of the fee schedule, if you will. So your agency, sir, is not one that I interface with in private practice law. There are there are other state agencies with which I'm much more familiar, which do operate that way. Can you can you give me the pros and cons as to why why you think it's most appropriate that we continue on course as opposed to setting settings? I, I give you a very specific example. The Department of Environmental Protection has a very mathematical process. A, a permittee who is who is cited 
with a violation by the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection can mathematically calculate on Excel spreadsheet, at least in the first instance, what his or her civil penalty will be. And it's then the, the secretary has some negotiating room from there. Are, are there are there what are the pros and cons of that from your perspective, from your agency? I think it could allow currently allows me discretion to use my knowledge and experience there. I like I said to Delegate Young there, if we review three or four violations a year, there are no two certain set of circumstances that are exactly the same there. So between Mr. Epling's experience and my experience here, we're using our knowledge and experience to fairly and equitably apply sanctions for our licensees. And I, I would like to retain that privilege rather than having it, if you do this, you get this, because there are no two set violations that are exactly the same. Well, I agree with that. That, I mean, that makes sense. Mr. Cole, do you, do you have or did you have enough data available to do any kind of statistical analysis on the data? I mean, I'm specifically asking about what the standard deviation would be on the fines. Yeah, we did not have that information available. We kind of tried to generate a population of violations and then identify instances of similar violations and compare those results in dollar amounts. Uh, we were able to identify the instances of similar violations in those different dollar amounts, but once we then requested the supporting documentation, we did receive violation reports to summarize the instances resulting in those violations. However, we were unable to make any assumptions on the commissioner's use of discretion and why he deviated in those. Okay, Commissioner, do, do you have this just chart with you? Yes, sir, I do. I believe so. It's on page three. Can you give me an example here of what? So I'm looking at a first offense $100 fine and a first offense $500 fine. Can you give me an example of what might trigger that? That, that chart that you're referring to is a 2009 chart. I understand, and, and I'm not I'm not holding you to the number. I'm just saying, what, what are the circumstances that, that might cause you to go from 100 to 500 on a first offense? Whether we caught 25 kids in a downtown hunting wall. All right, I, 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 this was one, one, one individual. Okay, good enough. All right, and that's all I'm going to ask about for now. Anyway. Or we, the president's going to ask something out, outside the report. Anybody else on the report? Okay, if not, if, if there's no objection, the president and I both have some questions outside the report, if that's okay. Okay, thank you. I didn't want to miss this opportunity. Well, nor do I, so go ahead. Uh, so, I've got a couple of them for you. We, we made a lot of changes over the last two years. Yeah, we, and I want feedback on what's working, what's not working. Or what we still need to do to make it so that we are, how do I want to put this, it, uh, competitive with our surrounding states. Um, and also, there's one, to, I want to hear your logic on that there's zero beer out here now, zero alcohol wine. And, but you've got to be of age to be able to sell, it's my understanding. That's something that needs to be changed or not. Tell me about that. Let's talk about non-intoxicating, uh, uh, non-alcoholic beer. Right. Mm -hmm. The duels, uh, course cutter, sharps, or non-alcoholic beer. They're, they are handled by beer distributors. There is no law on how old you have to be able to purchase non-alcoholic beer, and there's no law that you have to be a certain age to sell non-alcoholic beer. Those would be the duels, sharps, course cutter, there's no law on that. That's correct. And there's a misconception out there that there is. It, it is sold off the beer trucks, but anyone from, it, and it actually does have a small, small percentage of alcohol, 0 0.0, less than 0 0.005 or something to that effect. It's a minute percentage of alcohol, but currently today, in my 32 years of work at this agency and reviewing the code, there are no laws that prohibit, that set an age requirement to purchase or sell Odul's non-alcoholic beer. I answer the rest of the question now. Uh, going to the, what we've done over the last two years and whether there's anything from your perspective, has it worked, has it not worked? Are there other things that we need to do? I know you've got thoughts on this. When I came into this job in 2017, in February of 2017, being appointed as commissioner there, we had three different types of private club licenses. Today, with the legislature's help and support, passing ABCA's legislative proposals there, we probably have 20 different types of ABCA private club licenses. We have a professional sports stadium license, we have a multi-sport venue license, we have a college campus coliseum type license. 
we, we've, we had the first major change that we did when I came into this job was private club licenses came into effect in the state of Washington in 1967 there. In 2017, we created the resort license where basically say snowshoe at 21 different venues up there at snowshoe. We created one license, a resort type license, which basically licensed all the 20 some venues at the top of Snowshoe Mountain. That was the first major change in licensing in the state of West Virginia in 50 years. Since then, with the legislature's help, we have taken that above and beyond. My, my recommendation right now at this time would be, let's take a pause. You, the legislature has run 50 and 90 page omnibus bills for the last several years there. Let's take a pause and just to see how things are working. When, when people have unusual ideas or business plans to come in my office there, rather than me saying, law doesn't allow this there, I'll get my enforcement director, my licensing manager, my general counsel, Mr. Bossini there. We'll put our heads together to think, how can we make this work? My job is to put people in business there. And if, if we need, if the four of us come with an idea that say, we think we can do this work, we think we can make this work. If not, let's go back to the legislature with your all's assistance. Let's change the law to allow some guy that has a kind of a quasi off the, off the main, main track road there. But let's see what we can do to accommodate that challenge. There. I'm here to put people in business. Good morning, Your Honor. Father, outside of that, to, to, because you, you did, you, you spoke about the omnibus bills that you've done, and they've been huge. And, and I was. I figured there was more feedback on all that. The legislature has done tremendous work on that. Okay. Right off the top of my head, I'm, I'm sure when I'm driving back to Charleston today, something will pop into my mind. So let's talk about uh, premium alcohol. It, 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 you, you already know what my question is going to be. Uh, Rare allocated and highly allocated spirits. Right. Is there any way that uh, a bar could actually in another state, come in and pay the tax on it and then offer up that up at their establishment. Is there a mechanism right now? We have 182 licensed liquor retail stores in the state of West Virginia. Those 182 stores paid $54 million for the 10 year rights from 2020 to 2030 to sell that product there. So, requiring our licensed private clubs to buy a product off of our 182 retail license outlets there. That ensures that those folks will have a shot at the club business there. One, in, in my position, I'll be coming the chairman of the board of directors for the National IBCA here at the end of this month there. I'm going to try my darn just to use my leverage in that role there to talk to our suppliers to increase our supply of Blanton's, Eagle Rare, Buffalo Trace, Happy Van Winkle. We're a small state and we get small allocations, but I'm going to try to use my role to, to bring more product in this state. I, I consume spirits responsibly there. I'm a bourbon drinker. If I think I can bring a new bourbon in the state that I think we can sell, we've done that. In my role as commissioner there, before that, no one had ever done this thing, but we do these things called private barrel picks. Some of my team members now, we go to Kentucky there, we, do, we sample some bourbons there. And we, so we did, the first we did was Maker's Mark. We called it the West Virginia uh, Private Selection there, Series 1. And we brought three different barrels, 120 cases back to West Virginia didn't really affect the sale of our makers and all these new products that we bring in, we have some kind of connotation or affiliation with the state of West Virginia there. On the maker's mark, we have two area codes in the state of West Virginia, 304 and 681. We hand number each one of those bottles there. If you bought bottle 304, 681, we awarded you the empty barrel. So we're doing these barrel picks in, in, in Kentucky to bring them in products. We've done Whistle Pig, we've done Maker's Mark, we've done Elijah Craig, and we've done Yellowstone. And we're continuing to try to bring more bourbons into the state. Okay, I'm going to go back to my question one more time on this. And let's just use Patrick's uh, because we, there's not a whole lot that comes into the state of West Virginia for that. And, but when you're looking at it from the tourism standpoint, and you've got people coming from out of state and they're, they're, they're looking for that opportunity and they're willing to pay whatever it is on it. But they can't get it in this state. So I, I get the distribution network, how that works. But this is of the rarest of rares, so to speak, being able to make it so that they can come in, whoever there's a retailer or a wholesaler is, whatever you want to call them, that they can get their cut. What they want to do is just be able to purchase that bottle, or whatever, in Kentucky, in Virginia, wherever it's at, 
and bring it back into the state, put it up for sale, but that but to be able to do it legally, they want to be able to pay a tax on it. And right now, that's not available to the uh, state. Is that something that you would be supportive of? What I would like to do is take that thought, that idea, back to my general counsel, Mr. Bossine there, let him and I kick that idea around, see if there's some kind of solution we can come up with that would perhaps allow that. Yeah, because it goes, then it gets outside of our allocation and if you're picking it up somewhere else, then it, it, it's helping us with our tourism. My idea on the Pappy Van Winkle, I didn't hear you, sir. Uh, my idea on the Pappy Van Winkle, if I listen to what the brokers that distribute that product come and tell me there, they, they tell me that they, they want to send it to the five biggest liquor stores in the state of West Virginia. That's not my idea on how to fairly distribute that product. There. I want to send it from Mullins to Moundsville, from Huntington to Hedgesville, so that everybody in the state at least gets a shot at buying that product. Fifteen years ago, Pappy Van Winkle, you could buy it at the Elton Rite Aid from the bargain bin section there. Now there's such a cult following of that Pappy Van Winkle, it's like finding a unicorn. Right, and we're selling it for 160. We're on the street at the secondary market. It's selling for sixteen hundred dollars. It's crazy. So that, that's why I'm asking the questions that I am on, to see whether we can actually help our establishments out. Uh, first of all, I mean, if they're able to purchase it somewhere else where they can bring it in here and still be able to offer it up for sale, where it's currently not. I would sure be willing to speak with your own counsel and kick some ideas around and see what, what solution we can come up with. Great. Uh, I've had that constituent complaint a couple of times about that, so I'll use this opportunity now that I ask that question. Thank you. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. yeah, thank you for going outside the scope. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I have some friends that are licensees that say that they, there's a lot of red tape for processing licenses, that it is just kind of antiquated. Do you have a digital system where people can submit? They say they can't pay with a check. There's just like a lot of little processing concerns. We've, we've done a bunch of different things to try. So we, we want to cater to, the, to our licensees. Our licensees are our customers. We create a fillable form. You can go online on a computer and fill the form. And what we have found is our licensees take that fillable form, print it off, take a ballpoint pen and fill it out and send it up. We, at, for times where we allowed credit card payments there, our licensees did not like paying the convenience fee. It was always more beneficial to write a certified check, cashier's check, or money order. You get money order at 7 Eleven for 89 cents there. And we, we've got an excellent licensing. Our, our licensing specialist down there, those, those employees are excellent about guiding people and mentoring them through the application process. Like I said, we want to put people in business. Yeah, I have a, um, a, a huge uh, beer maker in Ohio just came over and they had to submit their, their form 12 times because. You guys would say, "Oh, well, the address is wrong," and then send it back, and then, and then the next big line would be instead of doing it all at once. It it, it ended up canceling, I think, twenty some events around the state because of it. It was a huge brewery. Have that out state brewery call me. Okay, it's fixed now, but it, I mean, it was a massive issue. But just some little red tape. Also, um, I have a friend that mentioned moving their location that they have to completely relicense. Everything is that something that can be easily done? It just seems like there could be a lot of really small tweaks that I don't know would even require legislation. That we could just bring things up to date. Like, why can't you accept a personal check? Our well, actually, during COVID, we did accept personal checks just as convenience to our licensees. But I think that we accept cashier's checks, certified checks, or money. So, why in that process? I guess it's just a more sound financial instrument so that we don't get. Okay. Return check, check and then is there an administrative fee included in license renewals for every renewal? Administrative fee. Uh, let's just say you, you have a carrot store, you're selling a beer, you're selling beer and retail wine. So the beer license costs you 150 a year, the wine license costs you 150 a year, there's a hundred dollar operational fee. So your your license for the entire year to sell beer and wine in your carryout store is four hundred dollars a year. Okay. The renewal processes are simple, basically. Certified check, cash or check, money order, uh, notarize the renewal application, you send it in, we'll send you the license. But out. is there an additional $100 processing fee included no, in that? So you're paying for the retail beer license, retail wine license, $100 off fee, that's it. Okay, you guys don't charge processing. No. Okay, okay, thank you so much. That's all I've got for now. 
Is there another meeting in this room at one o'clock? There is. Okay. Well, then with that, I think we'll thank our guests for, for being here today. And we appreciate you being here. We thank our post notification for the report. I can make one closing statement. Sure. Um, <laughs> as Mr. Cole points out clearly, that they, they brought this finding up five separate times. Today is the sixth time there. What I would ask the committee, the committee to do is we meet these horses in depth. Let's put this to rest. Let, let the commissioner and myself retain the discretion, use our knowledge and our judgment to impose fines fairly and accurately. Right, no, no. That would be my ask. Okay, thanks everyone. So the meeting adjourned. Yeah, I can.